Whilst I was researching for the last video about inertial guidance systems, I came across the miniaturization of what were basically large spinning flywheels, down to parts that could be fabricated onto a silicon chip just millimeters in size, and yet did the same overall function. But how small can we go with machines that actually do something? And is the age of nanobots from science fiction just around the corner? As many of you already know, a lot of my videos deal with the history of technology and the results which we are left with today. But often back then, there was no email, no digital overload of what seems like having almost everything available all at once. Back then, times were simpler and the correspondence was sent by letters, handwritten or typed. But it can be fascinating to see what was said between some of history's most interesting and important people. And now you can relive the letter opening moments by having authentic copies of these documents sent directly to you by post. Yes, the real thing, actual paper through the letterbox. And this is where Historic Mail comes in. Historic Mail was started by a group of history buffs who relished the idea of getting letters from historical figures on a weekly basis delivered direct to their door. Each week for 10, 25 or 52 weeks, you or whoever you want will receive an authentic copy of a letter from a historically significant person along with the historical context behind that letter. A couple which I picked out were from Walt Disney to the then Vice President Richard Nixon in 1956 and from Roosevelt to Churchill in 1942. The thing that struck me was that although these letters are 67 and 81 years old, the issues they discuss have very similar parallels to today. Disney, whilst inviting Nixon to a young reporter's interview, said that they would have some very challenging questions for the vice president. Like when they grow up, why should they vote Republican? And of Roosevelt to Churchill, talking about how he was constantly being plagued by the press who were persistently magnifying relatively unimportant domestic matters when there was the existential threat of war from Germany and Japan. The American History Gift Pack covers letters from 1776 with the founding of the Republic all the way to 1976 at the height of the Cold War. Historic Mail makes the perfect gift for history lovers, so this holiday season, why not surprise your loved ones with this timeless gift? And now you can enjoy 10% off of all their products with their Christmas sale. Go to historicmail.com forward slash droid and use the code droid to get your gifts now and help support us here at the channel. For centuries, the size of things we could actually make was limited to our ability to physically handle the objects, tools, and see what we were doing. For example, the fine watches built by Jaeger Lacoutte are still the smallest mechanical watches ever built. The Calibre 101, first made in 1929 and still made today, is just 14 millimeters long, by 4.8 millimeters wide by 3.4 millimeters high and weighs about one gram. Each of the 98 components are custom made by hand and weighs in the milligrams range. But they are so time consuming to make and so few of the watchmakers have the requisite skills to make them that just a few dozen examples are made each year. Beyond this level, the parts must be made by other processes. Our hands are just too large and their movement is larger than the components themselves. Clearly new methods had to be found. It would be the physicist Richard Feynman who would set the wheels in motion when he gave a lecture at Caltech on the 29th of December 1959 titled There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom, an invitation to enter a new world of physics. In the unscripted talk he laid out the idea of manipulating individual atoms one by one and that in principle it would be possible to make nanoscale machines that arrange atoms in the way we want and do chemical synthesis by mechanical manipulation to create new materials not found in nature. The only problem was that we lacked the technology to do this. Feynman put forward an idea that by using machines to build machines and each generation would make the next generation of even smaller machines and smaller and so on and so forth, 
and in greater and greater numbers until you reached the molecular level and you had billions of machines to create massively parallel operations. Of course, we do this now by chemical engineering, but in a way, these new machines may well build the machines of tomorrow. He also pointed out that when making these nano-sized objects, that the force of gravity will be much less of a problem. But other forces, like surface tension, and at the molecular and atomic scales, as the distance between atoms decreases, the van der Waals force starts to make atoms repel each other, such as with the varying electron density from one side of the nucleus to the other. Feynman also mentioned that glass or plastic would have a better uniformity at the very small scale than metal, because metals have a lattice structure to their atoms. Although his lecture didn't get much traction or have much of an impact for the next 20 odd years, it did resonate a lot more in the 1990s as the term nanotechnology gained serious attention. In the 1960s, with the advent of integrated circuits, the possibility of making tiny electromechanical devices on the chips themselves was first raised. The first of these was the resonant gate transistor, basically a tiny tuning fork made of gold beams 0.1 millimeters in length that would resonate at a given frequency and act like a bandpass filter that could have a Q factor of up to 500 and a gain of 10 dB. This proved that it could be done, and in the 1970s and early 80s, several MOSFET microprocessors were developed for measuring physical, chemical, biological, and environmental parameters. Today, this technology is known as MEMS or microelectromechanical systems. Sensors such as accelerometers are in your phone and smartwatch that pick up movement. Silicon sensors can do the same as rotating gyroscope by using a resonating or vibrating silicon ring suspended on spokes. When stationary, it vibrates in a regular way and the fixing points stay stationary. But when an angular force is applied or it's moved, the Coriolis force causes the ring to bend in one direction, which then moves the fixing points and this movement is picked up and the direction and the amount of movement can be calculated. The scale of these devices can be on the micrometer range, with the movement of this micro cantilever resonating at 17 micrometers. Biological sensors like this one for measuring glucose levels in the body and not externally have some parts like the titanium oxide sensing beam, which are just 600 nanometers thick and detect viscosity changes in the sample. These are all forms of surface technology. In other words, they are built on the surface of a material, the most common being silicon chips alongside the data acquisition electronics and CPU. But we have now entered the world of truly independent nano machines, devices that are not fixed down to a surface like in the MEMS devices. These are independent and some can move around by themselves. The field of science dealing with nano scale machines powered by tiny motors draws on inspiration from the natural world. In 1973, a significant discovery revealed that the flagella responsible for the movement of numerous microorganisms operates through a rotary motor. In 1983, French chemist Jean-Pierre Savage and his collaborators constructed the first cantonan, two interlocking molecular rings. These are unusual because they are not linked by chemical bonds, but by physical ones like the links in a chain. The next step was taken in 1991 when Scottish chemist Fraser Stoddard and his collaborators created a rotaxin, a cyclic molecule like the cantonen, threaded onto an axle molecule and end capped by bulky groups to stop it from coming off. So now we have a ring with an axle on it. In 1999, two groups led by Ross Kelly and Ben Feringa, respectively, built molecular rotors that had blades that moved in only one direction. Kelly's device achieved 120 degree rotation and was driven by chemical energy, while Feringa's completed a full 360 degree turn continuously and was powered by light. Then in 2011 came the nanomotor, when researchers at Tufts University USA produced what was then the smallest electric motor, measuring just one nanometer across and consisting of 18 atoms. It consists of a single molecule of butyl methyl sulfide on a copper surface, which can be made to rotate using electrons. 
Roll on 10 years and the researchers at the Swiss Federal Laboratory for Material Science and Technology successfully miniaturized the 18 atom motor to a more compact 16 atom version. This motor features a four atom acetylene rotor and its functioning intersects the realms of classical and quantum physics. Equally remarkable is the development of a single atom heat engine at the University of Mainz in Germany. This engine's central component is a calcium ion, which as described by its creators, operates akin to a combustion engine, undergoing expansion, cooling, contraction, and heating, therefore transforming fluctuations in temperature into mechanical energy. We now have all the components for a nano car, and when you have cars, you can have a race. And yes, there are now yearly championships at the CNRS, or the National Centre for Scientific Research in France, where teams compete to race their nano cars around a track of gold under a scanning tunneling microscope, which not only allows the participants to see the vehicles, but also provide the power for them. But that's not all. One of the dreams of medicine is to have nano machines that can travel through the blood to places around the body and deliver drugs to fight cancer and other diseases. These unimolecular submersible nano machines or nano submarines have already been developed and can carry RNA capable of reprogramming or killing disease cells. One developed at the Rice University, Texas has motors powered by ultraviolet light that rotate at two to three megahertz and can travel up to 25 millimeters per second, which is very fast considering it's just 20 odd atoms in size. And another nanomotor can carry a payload of drug across a cell membrane. And it's not just using atoms. DNA has been used to make nanomachines or nubots, nanobots of nucleic acids. These have already been used to make nano tweezers to grab molecules and walkers that can travel along strands of DNA. Now these might seem like slightly pointless exercises in chemical engineering, but the winner of the Nobel Prize 2016 in chemistry for the design and synthesis of molecular machines Jean-Pierre Sauvage and two collaborators said that the molecular motors now are at the same stage as electric motors were in the 1830s. We have a way to go before we see this technology in widespread use, but by then we will see ever more sophisticated machines that one day might offer the ability to make or change matter in ways that would seem almost like magic, not only to our ancestors, but maybe even to us today. So I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, then please thumbs up, share, and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video.